Uh, welcome, everyone. Uh, first, uh, I want to thank everybody to take their time today to join this uh, webinar, Women Inventors at Cornell University. I'm Alice Lee, I'm the Executive Director for CTL, Center for Technology Licensing. And in our office, we manage Cornell's intellectual property, catalyze technology commercialization, and promote startup companies based on Cornell's inventions and also supporting industry alliance leveraging Cornell's IP. Today, we're very fortunate to have four outstanding Cornell alums join us to share their uh, stories and insights about women inventorship and also in tech startups. For today's panel and uh, uh, the sequence event will be, I will share a few slides about some data talking about the status of women inventorship. Then we're going to have an uh, introduction uh, from the panelists, share their past as inventors and entrepreneurs. And then we're going to spend about 25 minutes talking about this uh, various aspect in inventorship and also how we're going to improve uh, women's participation in this. Finally, we're going to have about uh, 50 minutes Q&A session answer questions from the audience. During this session, uh, at any time, you can post your questions using the Q&A button. And I suggest people not to use the chat button. It will be easier for us to manage the questions from the Q&A session. So before we get started, we do want to know a little bit more about the composition of the audience today. And Linda will pose a uh, a questionnaire here, so please answer that uh, on the screen. Can you please uh, cast your uh, vote on that? Linda, can we see the result now? Okay, so we have the faculties and students and staff and Cornell alums. Very good. We're going to close that. As you can see, we're all uh, nerdy people <laughs> working in steps. So we will start with data always. And here's more data. So 40 year trend in women patenting. This is um, the data from US Patent and Trademark Office, the report from last year. And, and the most interesting here, please see the green line. This is indicate women inventor rate. What that means is that uh, in any given year, the patent granted by the patent office as unique inventors, which means that uh, it's not repetitive, among those inventors, how many of them are women? So as you can see from the chart, in 2016, the rate is 12% of the inventors are women. They certainly uh, grow a lot from the previous years uh, like four decades ago, like 3% women, but I think we all agree there's uh, uh, still a long way to go. So who are the women inventors? And also this is the data uh, from that, that report. And there are women in science and engineering occupations from biological science to uh, physical science to um, computer and, and also engineering. Average-wise, in 2015, about 28% of people working in this field are women. So comparing to the woman inventor rate, which is about 12%, there's a still a huge, bad, a huge gap, we can agree, I think. So this is about a different environment women inventors in. So this is on the top, the data from the universities in, about, in the past 10 years, I think the woman inventor rate is about uh, 18, 19 percent. And business is a little lower. And in the past 10 years is about like 12, 13 percentage. So how about a Cornell? So we did some study uh, based on the, on the invention disclosures uh, submitted, submitted to our office uh, in the past uh, near 10 years. So due to some historical limitation on the data, we only be able to pull some numbers from the women faculties. 
So 20% of the um, faculty, faculty inventors are women. And also, I uh, will pull some data related to technology startups we have. And from the women inventors, the founders rate uh, involvement in women is about 18%. So as we all uh, agree and know, um, for the future uh, economic development and wealth accumulation, technology and education will be very, it will be the critical factor to understand what nurtures women and help us understand how to better grow ecosystem to promote women in innovation and leadership will be extremely uh, important. So this webinar will try to help address this question and given the overwhelming response we have from people to be engaged in this discussion and help for the future. And we, we think this will be the first of the series of webinars or other similar events to address such an issue. So to get things started, uh, we'll hear from our panelists uh, with a self intro, particularly their path to inventorship and tech entrepreneurship. I will start with Pat first. Pam? Okay, okay. I'm Pam Marone. I'm CEO and founder of Marone Bioinnovations. We develop biologicals for pest management and plant health. These are extracts of plants or microorganisms and the substances they produce, and we deploy them for uh, controlling pests and increasing crop growth. I started my career, well, I have a bachelor's from Cornell University in entomology and a PhD in entomology from North Carolina State University. And I started my career at Monsanto Company. And I left St. Louis and moved to Davis, California, where I've been for 30 years. And I started three companies here doing the same thing, which is uh, looking for microorganisms and extracts of plants that can be uh, utilized for, for agriculture, controlling pests and increasing crop growth. And uh, we, we, we are in a very competitive industry, so patents are extremely critical. So uh, I did not get any patents at all when I was at Monsanto, the seven years I was there. And that was because um, the, we, were, we were developing genetically engineered plants to control pests, and the molecular biologists got all the patents. And they said that my group, which was testing all of the uh, constructs, was just a service group. However, um, we had to develop from scratch new testing re regimens for how you could test, like for example, corn root ornament had never been done before, um, these types of uh, materials like BT proteins and such. So uh, I was very disappointed that um, even though I had significant impact on the program at Monsanto, I was not put on any um, patents. So when I started my entrepreneurial career, I was very determined to make sure that um, uh, I, I was going to be patenting uh, a lot of things that uh, that we were and we were discovering and inventing and developing, and as a result, I now have more than 500 patents, uh, about 60 in the U.S. and the rest outside the United States. Do you want to do, uh, briefly also talk about your company? Uh, you, you started sure. the company. Sure. So my f the first company I started was um, Novo Nordisk Entotech. It was a subsidiary of Novo Nordisk, and uh, we screened about. Uh, 55,000 microbes looking for natural products. That was sold to uh, our largest competitor and I, when they had some issues in their, in their businesses and I started up AgriQuest. AgriQuest uh, also, I screened about 23,000 microbes looking for uh, uh, pest, uh, biopesticides and we developed a line of biofungicides that became leaders in, in, in around the globe. And they were uh, microbes that produce compounds that control plant diseases. And that I, I was going to take public, but uh, unfortunately started taking it public right before 9-11, 2001. So that didn't happen. And then, um, uh, so a, a new, uh, well, an investor took over and um, the company was eventually sold to buyer crop science for almost 500 million. I had left in 2006 and started this one and then uh, started up from scratch and our groups have screened another 18,000 microbes looking for natural products. Uh, and uh, we have uh, developed a full line of insecticides, fungicides, nematicides, and, and products for plant health uh, that uh, are growing very rapidly now. Um, these bio biologicals are, are is a very competitive industry, which is why patents are very critical. And we patent 
the microorganisms, the substances produced by the microorganisms, combinations with other products, formulations, and any new uses. Thanks, Pam. Ponzi, you want to talk about yourself? Hi, good afternoon, everyone. It is so nice to actually talk about the same industry as Pam. So um, I'm from agriculture industry as well. So um, um, my education, so I went to Johnson School, um, 99, and um, I'm a CEO at Inari um, right now. So I'll talk about Inari first, and um, we'll tell a little bit of my background, which is not that quite different from Pam. So, um, so I went to the big act and then um, um, came to Inari. So Inari is a startup. We are roughly around four years old. Uh, we were founded back in 2016. So what we are doing at Inari is essentially we do the multiplex gene editing. Um, so we use um, and also develop um, the CRISPR um, editing technologies, but rather than dealing with one gene at a time, we work on multiple genes at the same time. And the intention is essentially pretty much how we uh, work on those multiple genes to reduce the amount of land, water, chemical fertilizer, and the pesticide. Um, and we work on the major crops, the like of corn, soy, wheat. Um, and um, so, so those pieces that we work on, also we have the deep data science, um, the look into sequencing um, essentially in detail of those crops um, in order to, to make those um, gene edited crops, um, gene edited seeds. So that's pretty much about the, the background of, of Inari. Um, about the invention of, of the company itself, um, as, as you can imagine that in agriculture, there are a lot of, um, the IP landscape is pretty complicated. Um, the way that we look at the IP is not only about the technology, but about the processes. Um, as well as the products, as well as the go-to-market model. So um, across all the functions, that is pretty much we embed, uh, we embed the, the, the objectives on how do you actually innovate in every single thing that we do, um, not just only about the, the, the research team or development team, but every single team. Um, a bit of my background, um, I, I, I went to McKinsey first, um, which pretty much um, during that five years of McKinsey, I pretty much focus on agriculture. Um, and then I um, went to Syngenta, which at some point was uh, one of the, the biggest app input companies. Um, so was there for a while. Um, and then now, now I'm, I'm at Inari. Thanks, Pansy. Anais? Hi, everyone. So my name is uh, Anais Ramo. Um, I have uh, two hats uh, uh, that I'm wearing here. I'm uh, both um, a faculty at Weill Cornell. I'm a surgeon during the day. And uh, also, I am uh, one of the co-founders of Myophonics, which I presented uh, in November at the Entrepreneurship Summit, um, thanks to the support of Cornell CTL. And uh, basically, Myophonics is a wearable device that uh, translates um, muscle activity from the articulatory muscles of the face and neck and translate that into speech. Um, the idea stemmed from um, taking care of patients with limited voice, but also from my uh, personal uh, story with a grandfather who had lost his voice. Um, and um, I think um, um, I have a little bit of uh, more junior um, history when it comes to patent writing. I currently uh, have one patent application through Cornell and just submitted another invention. Um, it's really hard to point out what led me to this invent inventorship. I do have to uh, you know, acknowledge my uh, mother's impact on me. She uh, is also a faculty in medicine and a surgeon, and she also has multiple patents herself. So I never really thought of my gender as a limiting factor uh, when I was pursuing career. And that uh, continued until I went into surgical training and saw that men were getting a very different treatment and many other opportunities, which was fine because actually, um, uh, I really want to emphasize that actually I like having a little bit of an underdog position because it allows me to have a little bit more freedom and creativity and uh, also have room for surprising people, which uh, is my comfort zone. When I was in college at Cornell, I actually studied philosophy and chemistry. I was not the traditional uh, pre-med student, and I found that actually a background in the humanities really helped me think outside of the box, and I really encourage everyone to uh, take that into account in their curriculum at Cornell. Thanks, Anais. Bethany? 
Hi, everybody. My name is Beth Sia, and I graduated from the Johnson School in 2010, um, obtained my MBA there. Uh, currently, I'm an entrepreneur, deep tech entrepreneur, uh, startup advisor, investor, and also um, iCorps uh, faculty. So as an entrepreneur, I was the CEO and co-founder of Tactic. It's an NSF CBER award-winning computer vision uh, startup. The invention was uh, coming out, it came out from Cornell, from CTL, and uh, the startup's focus was on delivering image and location intelligence from real-time analytics uh, and reconstruction. So I led TACPIC from in inception as an invention all the way to its acquisition by Google. As a startup advisor, I uh, mentor, typically mentor startups that use uh, AI tools as a mechanism to disrupt their verticals. And in this capacity, I've worked with a very broad array of startups, uh, some in the healthcare industry, some in bio devices, others, for example, more in traditional computer science and software. Um, and currently, I am very excited about my role as a uh, uh, NYCRIN, the New York City Regional Innovation Node iCorps adjunct faculty. Uh, I've just finished training uh, this recent batch with the other members of the teaching team, about 13 deep tech startups coming out from uh, New York State region and also some across various other parts of the country. Uh, I have also recently been invited to become an instructor for the Cornell iCorps node. So if some of you decide to pursue the Cornell I Corps, I could very well be your instructor and I look forward to that. Thank you. Thanks all the panelists to share their story and the past into the today's uh, career. So as a person working in uh, STEMs and also tech startups and the field very often dominated by male, I want to ask you uh, to share your thoughts about what helped you in the past, you know, people, mentor, or other program helped you in this process? And also on the other hand, what did the, there are any issues and obstacles you have faced uh, in, in this past? And who wants to take this question first? I, I can go first. I can um, go first. Yeah, yeah. Go first. Um, so so I, I, I would put that, and Pam, please build on that as well. So. Um, I, I'll add on top of the STEM that you go into the agriculture. So it's even like double that. And um, I remember that the first um, seven years, um, actually, I want to say 10 years of my career in agriculture, more sort of biology there, um, it, it would be odd if I could actually see a, another female colleague next to me. Um, so I feel like hmm, really special only myself. Um, so it was it was quite hard. It was quite hard in that sense. Um, what uh, hard and actually not hard at the same time. So um, two things that I learned along the way um, were one is um, you're gonna need to actually not change yourself. Be yourself. Actually, don't 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 try to act like others and um, find your strength and the piece that helped help me a lot is rather than trying to fix your weakness. And by the way, being a woman is not a weakness, it's a strength. Um, how do you actually build on your strengths and get into the strength even more? Don't change yourself. Um, I, for example, myself being in agriculture and I build on it as I have pretty good relationship with the customers, uh, with the farmers there. And there are a lot of ways to go about it, even though majority of the farmers in the US are uh, male, but you know what, essentially I built pretty good relationship with the families of, of the customers. And you still need to talk about um, the how, where your kids are going to school and all sort of things. So building the trust from the family of the customers, um, um, has been helpful. Um, just don't change yourself. And the other piece that I learned along the way is um, growing up in, in this kind of environment, um, having a mentor, um, actually a mentor is not the right word, mentors uh, would be extremely critical. Um, and I purposely actually chose to have male mentors 
um, just to actually be able to think differently um, and understand, nothing differently, understand the perspective from the other angles. And um, when, I, when I started the career, um, I purposely had to mentor in the company as well as outside of the company. Don't get trapped into only um, your environment, um, looking at the bigger picture um, outside of that. That's, that's probably, um, I would encourage that. Um, so up until today, I'm, I'm conscious about how I build the team. So at the moment at Inari, we have roughly 150 people. We pretty much have 51% as female. Um, and out of 150, 122 are scientists and, 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 and half of the scientists are either with PhDs or postdocs. So we have the offices in here, Cambridge, Massachusetts, in, in Indiana, in, in Ghent, Belgium. So I, I'm, I'm pretty conscious how I built the mix of the team there. And my encouragement for, for everyone is be conscious about it, how you build a team and care about the diversity. And my leadership team, 50% is female. I'll join in there. And wow, the demographics, we have 51% women and about 150 employees as well. That's pretty amazing. Maybe because we're women CEOs, huh? Yeah, we That's do. very impressive, I have to say. It's <laughs> about building a, a diverse com company, that's for sure. But I would echo what Ponzi said. I, you know, being, I, was, I was the highest ranking woman in R&D at Monsanto way back when in the 80s. So um, uh, now, of course, uh, things have changed, but uh, I would be the only woman in the room. That helped a lot in some ways because you were always um, standing out. And it certainly helped me in my entrepreneurial career because I was typically the only woman in a, when, when I was speaking to venture capitalists at a venture fair, and I ended up uh, raising a lot of money uh, and didn't find so much that being female was a barrier. But I would echo what Ponzi says. I have many times modified myself and backed off from who I am uh, because um, you have a, a, nar a narrow range of, beha of acceptable behaviors as a female. And so uh, I think that's great advice if you're younger to uh, not make so many compromises as I feel like I've had in my career on that, that front. But as far as inventorship, I was determined to become an inventor, as I mentioned, because of my Monsanto story where I was not allowed to uh, be part of the patents. So I was determined, uh, but how do, you, how do you find out about it? I didn't have any training in that. I did go to, uh, a, I'm close to Silicon Valley and they had um, biotech boot camps and I was able to uh, get some uh, nice short courses in what it means to be an inventor and get some training in that. And, uh, and uh, then uh, starting companies, you realize you have to, uh, as CEO and PhD here, we have to develop the whole strategy for the IP around the company so that you have robust I IP that it would attract investors. And, um, and to this day, um, I'm very involved in that because we have a, an intellectual property steering committee that makes decisions on uh, on what what where where in the world to, to patent uh, is it commercially important, uh, what product lines to patent, what, how to patent, uh, what if we get into trouble if there's some issues with the patent office and how do we would get around those and do we need, need no experiments? I'm very very much involved in that because patenting and the IP of the company is so critical to the value of the company. And yes. Um, so I would like to uh, echo uh, some of uh, uh, what uh, Pam and Ponzi have said so far. I completely agree that, uh, you know, um, uh, being in a men-dominated environment uh, can be actually uh, inspiring and you can find a lot of mentors among uh, men, even as a, uh, as a young female inventor. And I would highly encourage that you, you seek that mentorship and, and that knowledge. Um, and, um, and for me, I've always been in uh, male-dominated fields, be it in undergrad, in philosophy, chemistry, and currently in surgery. So uh, men have always been my allies. And uh, furthermore, um, I'm a little bit of a competitive person, which I'm sure a lot of people are here. And um, I don't take no for an answer. And I remember once I went to an interview for fellowship, and uh, the person who was interviewing me told me, that as a woman with an accent, because I'm from France, I would have to work so much harder to get credibility. And that actually made me want to be successful. And uh, my field of laryngology is extremely men do dominated, which means that a lot of the ideas are homogenous and there hasn't been much change. So coming from a female perspective and especially being familiar with new technologies and new ways of thinking allows me to really come up with new ideas that haven't been brought up before. 
Bethany, you want to add to that? Yeah, yeah. Um, I would just like to uh, add a little bit of my personal experience. Um, I think as inventors, as women inventors and uh, entrepreneurs, I think we need to mentally prepare ourselves for a very difficult but also rewarding journey. And on, on your path, there are definitely going to be people who support you. And there are also going to be people who will doubt you. And this is, I think this is a very natural, natural experience when you are attempting to do something extremely hard and also very new, right? My advice would be to build your network, both from men and women, um, of people who are supporting you personally and also supporting your mission your mission through your invention and your mission through your startup. And along the way, there will be cuts. Uh, maybe sometimes it's like a thousand cuts. Uh, people will doubt you. They will doubt your ability to lead. They will doubt your, doubt your business acumen. They will doubt your technical acumen. But just remember, those people are not the people that should be in your network. Those are not the people that should take up your time. You should purposefully seek to support to get those who support you um, so I think that's just very very important and they say that in STEM women sometimes are discouraged because it's um, discouraged by a thousand cuts uh, little negativities uh, here and there but my my suggestion is to get your own armor be strong and seek out your supporters to go so you can go the path that you want to go mm. okay very interesting. Actually, there is this uh, question from audience right now, I think uh, speaks exactly to that point. And uh, uh, so um, actually, I, yeah, I don't see it anymore. So I, um, so the, the, uh, the uh, person asked and he's, uh, she's in engineering school and sometimes this, this imposter syndrome and she felt like that, uh, uh, it's multi multiple times she's asked about her choice in in study and also Korea and uh, have you any of you experienced that and how do you deal with that? <laughs> yeah, I typed, I typed a written answer, which is then I won't do that because that moved it over from open to answer on the. On I, the see, I see. I see. I see. That's what, what I said yeah. was for sure. Starting out, um, imposter syndrome loom large. And there's so many people who questioned, like what she said is, I, I, so much negative criticism when I started out as an entrepreneur. You couldn't do this, you should do that. Oh, it was amazing. So what I found out was that I would listen for patterns. Were there any patterns among the criticism um, and the comments that could then be used to strengthen my business plan? And, um, and, and that helped me become you know, better and better uh, over time and, and, and more confident over time. Mm -hmm. Very good. I, I, I would agree that absolutely right. It, it is actually okay to have that imposter syndrome. It is okay. The question is how do you actually learn from it and then how you take the benefit out of it and then how do you actually use it to encourage yourself more and then move on. Um, it is pretty normal to have it. Mm -hmm. yep. Very good. Okay, thanks. So one yes. last comment. Um, I think also nowadays, uh, maybe there is uh, less of um, uh, that atmosphere that uh, will create that imposter syndrome, mostly because there is an encouragement for women to become entrepreneurs. Now we're going to see how the pandemic is going to affect that as funds are decreased for, um, uh, for venture. Uh, but I definitely think that uh, it's a very good time to uh, enter entrepreneurship as a woman. And uh, if anything, it's a plus to be a woman nowadays in, in, in this area. Agree. Okay, very good. So as I also showed that some data earlier, there are obviously still big gap in terms of women um, inventorship and also tech entrepreneurship. And so in your view, um, what, is, what is the reason that women still quite behind in becoming successful uh, in this career? Yeah, Bethany? Yeah, um, Beth here. I think there is an issue of a funnel, right? The, the funnel is that we, we need to start out with encouraging more women, you know, maybe not even at the graduate 
graduate student level because I think that's that's most where the most of the participants are. But start out at you know I would even say middle school, high school to you know further encourage STEM education and further encourage entrepreneurship and build that as a role model for society, right? For the youth in society. And then when we have such an expanded funnel, the, the top of the funnel, then, you know, at, at each step for undergrad, graduate school, and then, you know, entrepreneurship in STEM, right? Then we have, have bigger, a bigger pool of people at the end of this funnel. Um, and I think the other, the other thing is that there should be very conscientious education of, of uh, teaching women founders and women inventors in particular, how they could think more broadly about the ecosystem, the business ecosystem of their inventions, and not look at just the technical merits of these inventions alone. So for that, there needs to be a lot of learning and training in, uh, in business, in IP, um, in uh, competitive analysis, and also in how do you go to market. So these are all items on the table that women inventors and uh, women in STEM should go for. Mm -hmm. uh, I w yeah, sure. I would say that I would echo that. And um, in graduate school, we had, well, it's many years ago, but now today, I'm sure there's the universities have more um, training, maybe, maybe boot, boot camps or, or seminars or workshops on inventorship because, uh, you know, I, I didn't learn for a long time what an invention disclosure was. And, and uh, universities were, were not good at encouraging mm -hmm. um, you to, to make inventions. It's all, you know, it's all about publishing. So today things have changed and uh, echo that you have to start young. And I, I'm really pleased that the Girl Scouts have focused on this. And uh, in our local area, Sacramento area, they have set up a, a maker space, which is a great place for uh, young girls to uh, go in and, and make stuff and learn about that. And I, I think it really does help uh, when it starts young like that. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Okay. Um, we also have a, a question from the audience. I think uh, maybe start with uh, uh, Anies. So he t she talked about uh, uh, elaborate on the ideas how to harvest strengths from the underdog position. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Sure. Um, so Kelly, uh, thanks for your question. Um, I think for me, uh, it helps me to uh, perhaps have lower expectations set on me because then I can surprise people and I kind of enjoy that. Uh, so for instance, one thing that I did when I started my first job, I was the first neurologist who was female in my, in my group at Cornell. Um, um, my director initially was telling me exactly what to do, how to set up my practice and everything. And I just didn't listen. I started applying for grants and, um, you know, the expectations were not very high. So uh, nobody thought that I would be getting the grants. And I got several grants my first year and that kind of already differentiated me from other people. So I think that um, having maybe um, other expectations just frees you up to uh, think in different ways and set your own path. Um, it really depends on your personality as well. I'm very independent, so it's easy for me to navigate those spaces. Um, if you're less independent, I think it's important to find a mentor, especially perhaps a female mentor um, who could really uh, show you the way. Um, and I'm happy to be that person as a start. Others want to also come on any of that? Okay. All right. So um, some of you already mentioned Bethany, Pam, and, and others about this ecosystem, right? beyond uh, um, you know, only focusing on things yourself. So how to build ecosystem to promote women uh, in inventorship, in tech entrepreneurship? And maybe you can share with us your insight, maybe uh, in general, what can support that, but also at Cornell, what program and resources we can provide to people to do that as a Cornell a general um, environment, but also as a, a tech transfer office and CTL, how we can help people to do that. Um, some, somebody want to start on that? 
But if I, if I could start, okay, um, then, um, two points there. I, I think this whole entrepreneurship um, by itself, um, my, my preference is actually rather embedded in into every single school rather than having it as entrepreneurship by itself. How do you actually embed it into an innovation has to embed it into um, the major classes? How do you think about it, whether it's engineering, whether it's the business, whether it's act, whether it's life science, whether it's medical? I, th I think we're going to need to actually embed it in. That's that's one. Um, it has to be the nature of how you go about it. Um, the second piece, I'll, I'll, I'll call out something slightly different. Um, around thinking about it as mindset um, rather than the hardcore piece of the entrepreneurship. What I believe is everyone can do it. You, you don't have to have the master or the PhD in entrepreneurship, but the, the biggest element is the mindset. And uh, I'm just gonna introduce something here and, and you can get to into the detail more, which um, recently I, I kind of enjoyed a lot around the concept of growth mindset. Um, mm -hmm. So the concept of growth mindset is there is no zero or one, there's no right or wrong. Um, what you're doing every day is about learning. And when you get into that, which would go back to your previous question as well, that how do you get um, us to innovate more and women from just my observation from my team that um, a lot of women actually think about it as whatever I do, it's either right or wrong. And we take a lot of responsibility that once we say it, we want to make it happen. And sometimes we may actually step back and don't even start because we are afraid that we're not going to finish it. And that's not the way to go about being entrepreneurial. Um, so take the risks, take every single step as is a learning. Um, there's pretty, pretty good book around it. Once you get into that learning mindset, it's actually the, excellent step for us to go with the being entrepreneur um, and you can think about things differently you will look at world differently and you would treat people differently um, whether that would be around innovation whether it would be around teams so i highly recommend just to think about it how you change the way you look at the world mm -hmm. uh, I'll jump in there uh, yes yeah. yeah, so uh, you know creating an ecosystem uh, for inventorship, you know, there's a lot of accelerators and incubators right now for entrepreneurs, and there's a very distinct focus on getting more women entrepreneurs. So I think there's a lot of, this is the best time to be an entrepreneur and, and certainly in ag tech right now, there's so many problems to solve. And, you know, it's interesting how many, um, you just got to put yourself out there and, and, and uh, I find a lot of people coming in through LinkedIn um, and just out of the blue, ask ask me for advice or or such and right now i'm um, advising four start women women led startups um, and um, it, it's it's some something that i have a passion about and um, i had on on um, uh, it's interesting how one graduate student uh, from one of the land grant universities said her professor said well she didn't couldn't help her in should she decide to go into academia or should she, she take something, some, something that she thought was a good invention from her PhD and go start a company? And so she said, well, I thought, thought about Pam Marone. And, and uh, so she just called me out of the blue and, um, you know, and called and said, you know, do you think I should start up a company around this? And she just said, yeah, sure. If you've got a great idea from your postdoc, or your PhD, why not? If it solves a real problem, there's a lot of money out there um, and uh, right now for even during the even during COVID, there's still a, a, a lot of money in, in our field for uh, for startups. Cornell is, uh, is is one of the better ones. I still see some colleges of agriculture pretty sleepy and uh, not really encouraging inventorship uh, of their faculty or their postdocs. Um, there's often also a, a program that's in the business school but doesn't um, cross over to maybe the College of Ag, but I'm glad to see that Cornell is uh, creating, creating the, the, the means in, um, in the College of Ag as well to, um, um, to cross over. Yeah, maybe we can work together, you know, among different colleges, have yeah. some, you know, central coordinated effort 
in in different aspects and you two are both in agriculture you know maybe with johnson school we can stimulate something together there <laughs> coordination to, between the colleges and the business school is really critical. right right and also you know from our side certainly we can promote the technology side as well but i think among different colleges and different programs certainly we can do that and uh, i i yeah. just have a, a a thought here um i think that everyone here, you know, we are all a part of the ecosystem. Mm -hmm. So when we talk about building the ecosystem, we're in fact talking about building a connection that would help strengthen you and I, everyone in this, in this ecosystem that we, we live in, right? And I think mm -hmm. a very important part of that is to mm -hmm. talk about the success and really celebrate the success. I am blown away um, just hearing all the, the accomplishments of my fellow panelists here today. Um, and I, I want to, I know, I know there are many, many more very, very accomplished, successful women inventors and women entrepreneurs in the Cornell ecosystem and the broader ecosystem in the United States and, and in the world, right? And I, I just want to, you know, urge, urge Cornell as an institution to highlight this success, highlight how we would like to help each other. An example I can give is, um, you know, the importance of highlighting is, um, have, have everybody heard of Katherine Johnson, uh, the mathematician who calculated mm -hmm. the orbital mechanisms that helped NASA put man on the moon, right? And she, for many years, her story was not celebrated. And also it didn't help that when she was working for NASA, none of the women none of the women mathematicians and scientists working for NASA were allowed to put their name on their work. But think about it, right? They calculated the orbits, right? They calculated how to send, send the, the, uh, the, the spacecrafts and, and uh, the astronauts to space, but they were not allowed to put their own names on their calculations on any of their work. And it wasn't until you know, very recently, a novel came out that celebrated the success of Katherine Johnson and her fellow mathematicians at NASA during that time frame that people began to know her work. So I think this just, when I read about this, my mind was just blown away by how important it is to highlight the success and celebrate the success. If you're not celebrating, the history does not exist. So, mm -hmm just the thought about how to strengthen and build an ecosystem. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I, I agree. And all of these things, the celebration is just as important, <laughs> right? And yes. through these stories and people are inspired and they're trying to do more things uh, about this. And also, uh, um, you know, to, to the comments about uh, the learning uh, mindset, one, one other thing my, my personal experience is sometimes the most important thing to, to know is it is okay to fail, right? So that's why with that attitude, it's maybe you'll be more uh, uh, pushing in some directions and to experiment various different things, okay? All right, we, we also have a question from the audience and uh, about finding female mentors. Uh, and then there are some, what is, uh, is there any different expectation from female mentor versus a male mentor? <laughs> that there may be sometimes conception that female mentor is more considerate and, and uh, warm. It, does that add pressure, more pressure to the female mentor? <laughs> so uh, anybody want to start that, Pam? I'm happy to do that one since I mentor uh, quite a number of women entrepreneurs. I have been told that I am kinder. <laughs> <laughs> them than uh, than others have been. Um, I just remember all the stuff that I went through, and um, all the all the trials and tribulations. And if I can help someone and cut someone a break through kindness and, <laughs> and consideration, by all means, because it's really tough to be an entrepreneur. And mm -hmm. uh, so uh, maybe maybe that's true. I mean, it's not. It sounds stereotypical that women are more considerate, but I don't know. I I, I that's that's what I've been told. So, but uh, how do you find, this question is, yeah, how do you, uh, how do you how go do you about finding them? <laughs> yeah, um, you know, it's surprising how many, um, you, you have to cre create a, uh, 
a, a, you have to network and, and you can network many ways. And, uh, um, and as I said, LinkedIn is a really good way. And just now, now there's, there, everything's gone virtual. There's virtual net networking events and virtual conferences and so forth. But it's, um, it's developing a, an ecosystem of people you know um, and, and then can get to know and trust because you, you don't want to take a, a, getting a mentor li lightly because they're, it's got to be somebody who's com compatible and also shares your values. Mm -hmm. um, just on the comments on um, uh, ideas of what a female mentor is like, I actually am not sure if we're kinder because it has happened to me in a, f a few times uh, throughout um, my young career that people have tried to take a a credit for some of my ideas. And so I'm much more careful actually in um, setting the boundary with people who seek my help and really making sure that um, I get acknowledged in, in their work if I'm contributing. Um, also, sometimes people think that because you know I'm a female, they can just address me by fir my first name and I correct them immediately. I tell them, you gotta call me Dr. Remo because that's my status. And if I were a man, you would call me by my title. So uh, um, I'm, not, I'm not sure if it is true that we're kinder. Other comments? Okay, sorry. <laughs> I was okay. Um, certainly, I think in terms of the mentorship and from our uh, office point of view, we're also trying to maybe from the central part creating some network for the female uh, mentors that are available to different colleges, and this in that way uh, supporting further. Uh, a mentorship and you know people may want male or female I, I, I think in the end it's it, it doesn't matter Ponzi mentioned earlier that many of her mentors are male but I think they're different aspect for female mentors while we're also I think this is one of the thing we're trying to maybe should help build that such a network within Cornell when, when people do seek for that right um, so there was a particular question for uh, Ponzi, and uh, you talked about different mindset, and she mentioned about this particular audience mentioned something herself afraid to fail and don't start in some occasions, and I want you to address maybe the transition to the growth mindset. It's um, it's a practice, um, and I would argue with you that I'm not there yet. Um, it's a practice every day, and um, the the best thing for me actually I. I talk to my colleagues, uh, my team members, to call me out when I'm not practicing it. Um, the notion, and I talk to my son. I ask my son to call me out when I'm not treating him like a growth mindset, which he loves it, so he's never wrong. Um, so <laughs> that's part of it. But but the core part of it is how you go about it is practicing and um, and and reflection. How to practice it is. Um, no matter how much you work um, each day, I really, really encourage everyone that you take at the minimum two hours to do the reflection. And one thing about reflection, don't reflect in a way that I used to reflect, which is about thinking about the future. So that's not a reflection. Reflection about yourself. What have you done over the past week um, that is not useful for others? What have you done past week that is helpful to yourself? And so on. So that's, that's the piece that how you transition, just have more reflection. That's how you transition your growth mindset. Mm. Okay, very good. Can I, can I go on to one question um, that's specific about business school? Um, yes. How do you write the piece about business school? One thing, um, you can talk about invention and, and, and a lot of things, but one thing, please do not forget. Why do you do it? Purpose. The way to differentiate yourself and why you actually can enjoy every single thing that you do. Um, let's make sure that your work become your hobby because you love it. And it, because it, it is your purpose, call out your purpose. That would be the way to go about. I see a couple questions. Maybe um, I can help answer. One audience asked, can CTL publish a semi-regular story about you know, alumni and uh, diversity inventors? I think that's a, a great idea. And uh, as we all say, the inspirations are very important and celebrate uh, all these inventorship and also entrepreneurship and now we talk about women but this is only one aspect of it right so there's other diversity and different group of people i think this is 
this is the purpose of this discussion. I, I think this, these give us ideas what we can do more to support this, I can certainly. Um, and also there was another question uh, to connect uh, with people and with women, but also women of color, as I mentioned these things. And when we try to help build more mentorship uh, for people and also celebrate success story. And these are the, certainly the things we can focus on, give people more network and, and strengths to, to and opportunities. Okay, I think that, uh, that's, uh, that's a great idea about this. So another thing I, I think Ponsi mentioned earlier in terms of the motivation, right? So this is uh, uh, certainly, I think in the end, how successful people are in whatever career. I think particularly in creative uh, type of careers, the, the uh, motivation and mindset is very important. So maybe some of you can share with us and you know, getting into this career and growing this career and now being mentors for other people, what's your driving force? I think that's a very important thing. Yeah. I'm happy to start. Okay. Yeah, yeah. I've spent my whole career tr trying to find ways to make agriculture more sustainable. It's just a passion of mine from, um, and I, it started in, in just when I was little. So it's, but I, I do think that it's really important, as Ponzi said and others, that you have to do something you really love, um, and and, uh, and 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 then create people around you and, and align, uh, find a team that of people who who are so, so beliefs as well. The, the employees that don't work out well in our, don't work in our, well in our company are ones who just see it as a job and don't really see it, you know, as, as we're, we're changing the world. But I'm very fortunate that I have a group of employees that are seeing, you know, seeing that, that we're changing the, changing the world. And I, and I think it's also very important to align yourselves with people who share your values. And uh, that's very, very critical because uh, there's, there, if there's discord, discord among uh, uh, value, value systems, um, it makes it very difficult to go forward um, with, with whatever, whatever you're doing. All right. I think um, we're coming to the an hour's end. And uh, I, before we uh, wrap up, I do want to share something within the Cornell uh, ecosystem. There are some other uh, resources and program initiatives uh, try to uh, focus and help women. So there's various uh, program, you can see that there are some are focusing on uh, women uh, faculty, some of uh, women in graduate school, in science, some for entrepreneurship, some from engineering school. So I want to just at least highlight a few here so uh, people will be aware of that. And we'll also try to promote this to uh, more people so they can utilize various uh, programs. As uh, some of you mentioned that how we connect different schools, how we embed that into the education themselves and make them aware of the things available to them. I think that's a, the starting point. We also want to work with these other initiatives and programs together for that. Right. Um, so, uh, and another thing, so today we have a very good discussion about uh, uh, various aspects of this. So uh, I'm very encouraged that, um, that we talk about mentorship and we talk about education and networking and challenging women in various ways. So I hope this is a uh, starting point, we're more focused on this. And certainly we want to, as I said, as a result of this, uh, creating more programs and uh, networks to help women. And also we said for this webinar, this is, will be the first uh, of the series. We can do uh, more webinars or uh, other events to promote that. Actually, we're already planning for the next one, which we uh, want to invest, uh, invite uh, women uh, VCs, venture capitalist people, to address some of the investment, more at networking uh, opportunities for our women inventors and to and and also for others to help people with more opportunities and uh, uh, investment and network uh, potentials. All right. So I think uh, we're at the uh, end of the program. 
Uh, first, I want to thank our panelists for uh, their participation and also share their stories and insights about their own career paths and about how to improve Cornell's um, program on this and inspiring us to, to actually work further on this. And I also want to thank the audience for their participation and interest. We hope to work with you more and to continue this discussion and grow Cornell's ecosystem. And also I want to thank uh, CTL staff who organizes Linda Insig, uh, who is the main one organizing these events and get things together for this, and Camilla Dell, who helped with the coordination on this program. And thank you all for this. At the end of this uh, webinar, after we, I close this, actually you will see a very short survey. I hope you can fill, take a minute to fill that, so help uh, our future events and also programs. Thank you very much.